If there are two things I can tell you about YouTube, one, it's a great tool for making reading productive. If you're watching this video, cast your mind back to any of the great and important books you've read in your life. And imagine if you challenge yourself right after reading the book, when it was still fresh in your mind, to make a video summarizing what it meant to you, why it was important to you, why you read it in the first place, and then how it was different from what you were expecting or looking for. If you'd made videos like that, even if you never went back and watched the videos again, the process of gathering your thoughts and presenting them in video format for any of the important books you've read in your life would be tremendously meaningful. It would enrich, it would enrich the reading you've done. It would make it more intellectually productive. And I think it is also, for those of you who are not blessed with a photographic memory, it is an aid to your memory. Then you can also go back and, and watch the video and, and have a laugh. For me, I am blessed and cursed with a very accurate memory. I think it does make a traumatic experience in my life haunt me more and certain kinds of regrets and remorse and what have you is more of a burden for me. Uh, however, it is really bizarre for me right now. I mean, to, to give one example, this is uh, Constitution of Athens by Aristotle. When I was reading this, I could remember reading the same text um, when maybe when I was 19 years old, maybe 20 years ago, and I could remember how my impressions of it then were different from my impressions now. But anyway, but even so, um, I stand by what I say. You know, gathering your thoughts and putting them into a video, a tremendously productive way to make, make reading productive, make reading of meaningful texts more meaningful. Um, and then secondly, there were two points. There were two things I was going to say about why, why making YouTube uh, 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 videos about your, your reading is, is, so, is so productive and meaningful. Maybe, maybe the second one will come back. No script, no edits, keep rolling. Um, oh, right, that was it. And the second thing I was going to say is making YouTube videos with the reading you're doing definitely makes unemployment more productive. And that's that's my segue to the next next part of this video. Because, I mean, you, you actually had some anxiety about this period of unemployment in your life, which is understandable. Now, Melissa, sorry, if you don't know who you is, I'm, I'm, I've got my best girl Melissa here with me off camera. You know, Melissa is a goal-oriented person which I used to be. Life forced me to become more process-oriented, right? I mean, being process-oriented is like, well, I'm learning Chinese. I don't know how much time I've got to put in Chinese. I don't know what the outcomes are going to be. I don't know if I'm ever really going to get fluent in this language. I don't know if I'm ever going to use it. It's going to be part of my job, but I've just got to appreciate the process as an end in itself, right? Like the learning process has got to be satisfactory because I don't know what the outcomes are going to be. It's hard. It does not come to me naturally, and I've had to do that with so many things I've been engaged with, where I've had to stop being goal-oriented and become process-oriented. Melissa is a very uh, 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 goal-oriented person, and like most goal-oriented people, or many, she does kind of get a sense of self-esteem, positive or negative, out of those goals or lack thereof. So part of the context for our deciding to get on this, you know, course of reading, get this uh, self-education kick with the, the, these ancient Greek uh, and Latin texts in English translation, was that, uh, you know, Melissa was saying to me, in effect, look, how are we going to make these these couple of months, this gap in our schedule, you know, how are we going to make it productive? Now, I admit that that's the way I'd phrase it. That's not the way you phrased it. But that was that was really the the question in the air was how we're we going to make this time productive how we're we going to make this reading productive and you were feeling lousy about yourself and I mean you know it's it's kind of weird but I mean I think before you started this unique experience in your life you, your self esteem would have been higher if you had a minimum wage job at Starbucks as opposed to feeling like you're unemployed and there's this this gap in your schedule now I just mentioned the gap in our schedule is is brief there's already a video explaining we're about to go to Paris and telling you guys to meet us or help invite us to an event when we're in Paris. We're going to be in Brussels. And then we get back from Paris, and then we have like one month to do some more reading and learning. And then we're in school. So starting in September, we're, we're in classes. So we, it's a finite gap of time during which we're, during which we're employed. But yeah, YouTube, um, it's a very different sort of structure than studying for an exam. It's, I, f I feel this shirt is too small on me. I'm just being honest. <laughs> just being honest. All right. No, but if I don't do a button, it looks, looks too inviting. All right. <laughs> uh, I need a gold chain. That's yeah. what I mean. <laughs> Look, um, uh, uh, 
uh, it's very, very different from reading a book like this in order to make a deadline for a university essay, or reading a book like this, prepping for the answers that are going to be on an exam. You know, you're reading these things for what's meaningful and what's, in, what's important in them. But then also, I mean, Melissa's doing this very formally. She's gathering her thoughts and putting together conclusions, um, you know, for, for a series of YouTube videos. Okay. Now, what's really missing here, some of you may be wondering, why didn't I make this video at the beginning? Of our, of our doing this reading. Well, for one thing, we've been busy. We had, we had other things to do. But, you know, there's a really weird scene not captured on tape that was really passionate and really emotionally overwrought where I sat down with Melissa and I really told her why this was worth reading. You know, I made this very passionate, you know, speech. Now, again, in terms of context, part of this is the issue of unemployment and Melissa was kind of feeling down about herself in terms of her goals, what she was doing at the time. And just to mention you guys also, Melissa is simultaneously learning French and before you were learning Chinese, you've taken a pause on Chinese. So she got other things going on intellectually, but still, uh, this is not enough for her self-esteem. And, you know, there also, we talk a lot about politics from every period of history. In any given week, there's a lot of talk around this stuff. So in part of the context of me sitting down and giving this kind of passionate plea for the importance of studying ancient Greek and Roman sources. And, and it's a short list. I don't mean everything. I'll, I'll give you guys the list of, of what we're reading and what I recommend you guys read. What I think of is kind of the must-read the must read stuff here. Um, part of what I was able to say to her, look, the other day we were talking about politics in 18th century France. It's important. Yeah, kind of. But there's no way I can say to you, like, here and now, this is a gap in your education. This is something you didn't learn at University of Michigan. This is something that really matters for the rest of your life. You've got to buckle down and do politics and philosophy of 18th century France. I don't think that's true at all. Um, you know, whatever. We probably talked a little bit about 19th German, 19th century German philosophy. We talked about, uh, within that period of time, we talked about the signing of the American uh, Constitution, the debates, you know, in that period of American history. Uh, I had I had been reading something I may or may not talk about a little bit in the same video. I had read this short but dense book. I read it very thoroughly on the history of the, the English Civil War, so uh, 1630s, 1640s, 1650s in, in England. Um, you know, important and interesting, but none of this has the the monumental, fundamental, profound significance of these ancient Greek and Latin sources, and here's why, you know. Um, so I mean, it, was, it was this very passionate, I mean, <laughs> very emotionally overwrought speech. And for me, I'm someone who, who comes at this, I, I, I was very anti-Eurocentric. Um, someone who's been anti-Eurocentric for a variety of reasons, but I think the most obvious being that the quality of university education I had was also terrible, right? So you come out of the disappointment with the Western university education system. In my case, I made a transition to being a scholar of Buddhism which doesn't give you, gives you a very different perspective on the history of philosophy and politics in the world. So once you're working on Buddhism, I did both ancient and modern. You know, I did, I did um, sorry, ancient, modern, medieval, the whole, the whole span. But it includes questions like, how did Buddhist societies abolish slavery? How did the status of women, women's equality, democracy, how did those issues emerge uh, in, in Buddhist societies? How did Buddhist societies react to um, you know, the progress of science, you know, obviously very different from how the Catholic Church reacted to the progress of science, but still there's a tension between tradition and, and modernity there. So w once you're into Buddhism, and in my case going right back to the most ancient period of ancient Buddhist literature uh, 2,500 years ago in the Pali language written in India, so all of a sudden the, 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 the colors on your palette, the colors on your palette as a painter that you have to draw from, aren't just, you know, Greece, Rome, France, Spain, England, now you've got India, Japan, China, well, Cambodia, Thailand, Laos. You know, you've got um, this, this much more diverse and, frankly, deep range of world historical, cultural, and political experiences to draw from. Now, you, sir, but this comes up. I've had many videos mentioning the abolition of slavery. And people, I've seen this face-to-face -face with people, and I know what happens over YouTube. People are often stunned when I just start using examples like Haiti, uh, Sri Lanka, Thailand, like, oh, you thought you thought Texas was the only place of the history of slavery. Well, you're wrong, you know? There's a diverse, you know, this is part of the human experience on planet Earth, the question of how do you abolish slavery. Sorry, and also the question of abolishing, abolishing slavery already comes up in, uh, in ancient Greece and Rome, in case you hadn't heard. So, you know, it's true. I mean, if, if Melissa had met me 10 years ago, it's hard for me to put a number on it. But, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I used to be more anti-Eurocentric I was much more skeptical about 
stating the value, the unique value of these these ancient Greek and Roman sources. Sorry, ten years might not be might not be long enough ago, where it was much more into saying, well, no, this is just one corpus of ancient text that's meaningful. And what I sat down and said to Melissa was, no, you know, this is of unique, astoundingly important significance for about five different reasons, and I'm maybe going to remember two of them, you know, in this video. Now, one was. It's only if you get in touch with these ancient texts that you're really going to understand the tragedy of Christendom. You're going to understand what was lost and what was destroyed. Now, the culture of ancient Athens, pre-Christian Athens, pagan Athens, however you want to put it, was astoundingly productive in terms of the arts, in terms of poetry, in terms of theater, in terms of the rudiments of science. I'm saying the rudiments of science advisedly. But really meaningful questions in science were being, were being asked and answered. And in terms of the rudiments of politics and, I dare say, political science. And these things were linked. The way in which the society was productive, and my, this is my way of expressing it, I said to um, Melissa, look, Christianity provided people with comforting certainty. Something to, be, to, have, to cling to, to have faith in. It provided a blanket of certainty. And if you dared to you know, kind of peel back the blanket, if you, if you questioned those, those publicly inculcated certainties, of course, you'd actually be persecuted. You'd actually be, be punished and so on. You know, look at what happened to Galileo, etc. But, you know, the, the, it, it was enforced. But this created a culture of, of certainty. And by contrast, I'd say, I mean, very few people would use this in a positive sense, but I do, Athens was a culture where everyone was in this state of uncertainty. And you see that even in these, these texts like the Euthyphro, uh, these texts from Plato that are on this list. It's like, look, this conversation happening in play, which is not the deepest conversation, it reflects so many things about this culture and the way in which people were always on their toes. People were asking, you know, what is good? What is goodness? What is piety? What is religion? I mean, in Catholic Europe, nobody's asking that. In a sense, nobody's allowed to ask that. It's a very limited range of permissible debate and permissible questioning. The fact that these are people who are asking, how do you calculate the mass of an object through water displacement theorem? How do you uh, estimate the size of the Earth? Is the Earth a sphere, or is it a drum-shaped object, or is it flat? You know, uh, uh, the questions about the, the stars and the, pass the pathways of the, the planets in the solar system and so on. Yeah, it's easy to look at that in isolation. These were people who had to live every day with the awareness that they could be hauled into court and accused of almost anything. I mean, there was a deeply litigious society, incredible levels of backbiting and infighting, and questioning and self-questioning. And, of course, we can see the, the harm that does, including that it got Socrates killed. I mean, ultimately, there's a, there's a price in blood for this. Uh, the vibrancy of the theater, you know, in this culture, um, that they embraced having uh, uh, theater ridicule and excoriate and criticize public figures, including Socrates, and it got Socrates killed. Um, you know, so political figures are being elected and they're being kicked out of office in very short spans of time. They're, they're being, uh, you know, the, the, the decisions made by political leaders are being debated openly and questioned openly. And people can be dragged into court because of what they said in that debate or because of some business practice or some idea or for insulting the gods or for doing something impious. And nobody really knows. There is no simple authority like a papal authority. What does it mean to be a godly man or what does it mean? to be a heretic. All of it's open for debate all the time. Everybody's debating everything all the time. And I mean, I think uh, it's kind of dumbed down when it's just it's told to students, oh, well, there was a lot of scientific progress. Well, you know, you can say there was a lot of theatrical progress. What does that mean? You know, um, this was this was a, a, a culture in which people were coping with um, a, a sort of an o overweening omnidirectional doubt and, you know, the texts we have show just how, you know, tremendously stimulating that was for human intellectual development. And so, again, kind of jumping ahead, uh, the, the fact that so many of these authors had just come out of this civil war. So, sorry, 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 I'm calling it a civil war. It's, it's a civil war within Greece, but it's the war between Athens and Sparta. So it's not really a civil war. It's the war between two, two city-states contending a sort of Greco-Roman nation or empire. You know, uh, sorry, I say Greco. Anyway, whatever. Sorry, greater, greater Greek area. You know, some islands from Italy are included uh, in, in the map, and so on. But look, the war between Athens and Sparta doesn't produce in Athens a generation of writers who just regard Sparta as evil. On the contrary, almost every single author we're looking at, including Aristotle, who's a generation later, they have this tremendous esteem and respect for Sparta. 
they're beaten by the Spartans and they analyze their own society and say, okay, what are we doing wrong? You know, what are our shortcomings? What are the Spartans doing right? There's this tremendous openness. And you see that, by the way, you even see that in Herodotus, with Herodotus looking at the Persians. So the Persians are more foreign. They don't speak Greek. They don't worship the same gods. I guess the Spartans don't really either. Anyway, similar religion, at least. Um, you know, uh, 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 this, this tremendous capacity for self-reflection, self-criticism, analysis of outer cultures and their own culture and, and, and questioning what's wrong and so on. So I just say... Um, this is setting the stage for why this culture, why this Athenian culture at this moment in history is of such unique significance, is, is so uh, tremendously important to study. Uh, only when you've appreciated it do you understand why. I mean, one of the examples I, I used for you was it's horrifying to think that Christopher Columbus in 1492 was relying on maps from this period that fundamentally hadn't changed since Herodotus. He was actually using specifically the map from Strabo, S-T-R-A-B-O, but Stra I've, I've seen Strabo's work. I've, I've read all of Herodotus. Strabo is basically like an updated revision to, uh, to Herodotus. Anyway, you know, he was taking this and presenting this, so whatever, approximately 2,000 years later, uh, not to put too fine a number on it. You know, it, 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 there would be no progress in the sciences. There'd be no progress in geography. There'd only been regress. There'd been this terrible, terrible intellectual deadening in Europe uh, due to the rise of, of Christian orthodoxy. And of course, something similar happened in the Muslim world where Muslim orthodoxy took over. So this is not uniquely Christian, but the two religions have, have a lot in common. Um, you know, so you only appreciate that by plunging in these texts and seeing what was there, seeing what was lost. Um, okay, so secondly, why is this uniquely significant? Well, you know, I mean, democracy, something I appreciate more now than I even appreciated, you know, a couple years ago. I mean, democracy is produced by really rare and peculiar cultural circumstances. So I think I've already talked about this kind of intellectual, the, the intellectual cross currents in Athens that made it stand out so dramatically. And it made, meant that Athens, not Sparta, is still today this symbol and guiding light for our civilization. Now, um, again, I did all this scholarship on Buddhism. Those conditions, or the, that kind of culture, did not arise in Sri Lanka. You know, Sri Lanka had a golden age, in case you guys don't know, when they built... Technologically, they were more impressive than Rome. I, I mean that, honestly. I've been there and seen the seen the ruins. I've seen the remains. They developed, you know, wonderful... Uh, anyway, waterworks. They had uh, fountains and sewage systems, and they, they built all kinds of stuff that was more impressive than Rome. They carved out caverns in the face of these remarkable cliffs. They built palaces on the tops of mountains. They did all kinds of stuff that's still, you know, it's it's in ruins, but you can look at it and go, wow, you know, these guys really had their act together as a material cultural civilization. But they remained, for all that, a crude despotism. A crude despotism based on, you know, Buddhist uh, dogmatism rather than Catholic dogmatism or Muslim dogmatism. So it had some nice aesthetic features for that reason, a little more forgiving and accepting and, you know, uh, a little bit less awful a society in many ways. But they, they never managed to, to light the same spark that Athens lit, right? Um, so, I mean, uh, and I say this again, you know, this, when I, look, brief digression, in terms of the progress of my own learning, at any one time, there's gnawing away at me an awareness of something that's a gap in my own education. So two of the gaps I've tried to fill just in the last month or two, I really always knew I didn't know enough about the English Civil War, again, 1640s being the, the central decade, and I knew that I'd never gotten around to reading Cicero on the Republic a text that's also called um, On the Commonwealth by Cicero. And when I read these two books simultaneously, I didn't think there'd be any overlap between them. But it is to my astonishment that in the middle of this book, the King of England basically stands in front of a court of inquiry uh, set up by Parliament and defends his actions by quoting verbatim the philosophy of Cicero. So, I mean, this is another one of those stunning things, like, you know, 1492 Columbus making this proposal on the basis of Herodotus and Strabo, these ancient texts. Political philosophy progressed almost not at all. It only regressed. It utterly failed to progress in more than a thousand years of Christian dominion. Now, why is that? I mean, people didn't just suddenly get stupider. There's, there's a lot to it. 
But I should say, well, you know, partly, I mean, maybe there is a real sense in which we have to reflect. People got stupider. Because, you know, what is intelligence? What is it that fosters intelligence? You know, so I was just reading Aristotle again, uh, preaching about Aristotle and Plato have this in common. For both Aristotle and Plato, what they really want is to have a public system of education. That's one of the reasons why they worship the Spartans, even though the Spartans are their hated enemies, supposedly more. Because Sparta did have a system of public education, no matter how twisted and perverse it was. It was pretty, it was pretty weird, people. It was pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty demonic. Um, teach, teach children how to steal. Keep them starving and teach them to steal, because if they steal, they'll be cle- clever. But if they get caught stealing, they're whipped and beaten, like... That, that was part of the part that was part of their formal system of education being a thief is clever but getting caught is stupid so learn your lesson kids this is part of their formal education boom but they did have a system and you know Athens did not at all they just had private tutors and you know and what have you so you know Athens had a lot of disadvantages but they nevertheless had these social conditions that included the theater and the constant lawsuits and everyone being called in for jury duty, 500 and more people, you know, 3,000 people being on a jury, 3,000 people being convened to debate whether or not we should go to war. Oh, we have a proposal for the public budget to do this or that. Pull in 3,000 people, hear the speakers, debate, discuss the orders. All these things stimulated really high levels of intelligence in people. And again, I think that's probably because learning is lifelong. You know, I, and not to boast unduly, I'm an example of this. I'm someone who didn't stop learning when he left university. You know, to a massive extent, I was stimulated to keep learning, keep growing, keep challenging my assumptions. In the same way you can see, say, even in the total absence of formal education, Athenians were being stimulated to, to, to really develop in this way. Anyway, look, uh, sorry, coming back to the, the, the point I was making here, and then back to Athens, and then we're out. <laughs> um, uh, what Cicero was actually doing was um, really subverting democracy. He was presenting a totally insincere argument for why ancient Rome, the Roman Republic, the idealized Roman Republic, had just enough democracy that it's not a tyranny. And you can get into the details, but it's, it's a very insincere argument. Now, also, England, circa 1630... It's a total joke to say that it has all the best features of democracy. But that's exactly the argument the King of England made. When, By the way, he was fighting for his life. He ends up eventually getting executed. It takes a long time. Several you know, wars come and go. But he ends up eventually on the chopping block, the, the King of England. Um, but, you know, he's arguing that his regime, it's not a democracy, but it's a hybrid of monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy that has all the best features of, of, of democracy included, right? Um so, I mean, centuries have gone by between Socrates and Cicero, and many more centuries go by between Cicero and and uh, and the King of England. But you have this, you know, touchstone. You have this standard for, you know, what democracy means. Sorry, I have to interrupt myself again. The fundamental point and the fundamental problem here is a parliament is not a democracy. <laughs> Really, in the history of England, this is the difference between England, British history and colonial history, history of a colony like Canada or the United States, Parliament didn't even pretend to be a democracy, right? And today, people have their wires crossed on this fundamental issue. A Parliament is not a democracy. A republic is not a democracy. And again, that's in Cicero, and that's in the mouth of the King of England, and so on. A Parliament is something very fundamentally different in its function, and its design, and its creation. It even goes back to the meaning of the word parley, meaning a, a meeting of, of war chiefs, a meeting of, uh, of, of army generals, and their meeting to discuss raising the taxes for a war, etc. The, the actual function and creation of, of British Parliament, what it's, what it's supposed to serve. And the other lesson that the British public learned from these, these, this terrible civil war is that a Parliament can in every way be a tyrant just as much as, as one man. There's the pure, tar, parliamentary tyranny is just as r- real as the, the tyranny of, of one man or ten men. You no know, oligarchy or what have you. It's, it's not hard for a parliament to do all the evil things a, uh, a, great, a, great, a great tyrant uh, can do. Um, but it's in Athens, and it's in Athens only. It didn't, it didn't happen in Japan. By the way, a lot of things independently happen in Japan. I just mentioned Japan is a totally separate... Japan invented the stock market independently. You know, the Japanese and the Dutch completely separately invented this idea of buying futures on the stock market. No connection, you know what I mean? Um, I'm told, I don't even know if this is true, but in India, uh, uh, they completely separately invented quite a long list of, of technological innovations, including, you know, uh, breaking white light 
into colored light through a rock crystal, uh, steel smelting, you know, creating steel. There's quite a list of things human beings in different continents at different times <laughs> managed to invent independently, right? Uh, including written language and many fundamental things like that. But uh, a democracy really has a monogenesis. <laughs> it's a, it has one origin. It has one origin, and it's delicate, and it doesn't last, and it's so intellectually vital and artistically vital and productive, and it's so self-critical. Almost all the sources we have, sorry, including Aristotle, including Thucydides, including Xenophon, almost all of them are living in this unique moment when democ the ball gets rolling for democracy, and they're the harshest critics of it. You haven't gotten this yet, so Melissa hasn't gotten this yet in Thucydides. Thucydides is rough on democracy. <laughs> and, and he lived through that war, right? He lived through that war. He saw what a joke democracy... One of his... Sorry, Thucydides, one of the fundamental reasons he hates democracy is he says it's starting new wars all the time. If you leave it in the hands of the public, you just have a meeting where they all get whooped up, they all get to vote on war. They're going to go to war every time, or, you know, they're, they're always going to want to raise the war budget. So that was that was part of his, his reason for being fundamentally opposed opposed to democracy. But yeah, um, um, when you when you understand and appreciate that, so these are the these are the contrasts real quick. The contrast between ancient Athens and the dark ages of Europe, the dark ages of Christendom that come thereafter. The contrast between ancient Athens and Sparta, that's just next door. I mean, there's other interesting contrasts, like between Athens and Egypt, between Athens and Persia. But above all else, the really instructive contrast between uh, Athens and Sparta, where the Athenians are, are examining their own society, they're examining Spartan society, they're asking what is freedom, what is democracy, what is it, what, what is the meaning of empire is another thing being being debated. You know, what is what does justice even mean if your kingdom is if your polity, your political system is built on conquering and looting and robbing other people and and piracy and what have you? We talk about justice, but at the same time, we call people heroes when they carry out you know piratical looting and raids and sometimes rape and murder and, and so on too, you know. Um, these, these, these fundamental uh, uh, questions um, being asked. And then, uh, you know, skipping ahead many more centuries, um, the contrast between democracy, democracy in the strictest sense, and parliament. Parliament is not democracy. Between democracy and a republic, whether it's the Republic of Cicero or the Republic of the United States of America. And of course, you can say more easily, the contrast between democracy and monarchy today, not that... Not that many people are saying, hey, you know what? You know what we could do to, to improve Canadian politics? We could learn a thing or two from Saudi Arabia. You know, this. <laughs> maybe we can learn something from Switzerland. Maybe we can learn something from Denmark. Nobody's looking to imitate the, the political arrangements in the, the world's few monarchies. Neither Saudi Arabia nor, nor uh, the United Kingdom. But these are profoundly important, profoundly meaningful uh, contrasts that still really matter today. And where I really had to say to Melissa, look, I absolutely believe this may be the last chance in your life. You've got a couple months where you're going to be in school. Take these couple of months and pour your energy into getting a foundation in these texts from ancient Greece and Rome. They're going to matter for you for the rest of your life. And something else that I said spontaneously in that conversation, I said, the more you read about politics, the more you realize that everyone who ever mattered in the history of the world read these same texts. Now, of course, you can put in a caveat there. You know, this is this is a Eurocentric statement, you know? <laughs> but still, even as soon as these texts were translated into Japanese, everyone in Japan read them. I'm sorry, I've done research on exactly that. Even Thomas More's Utopia was translated to Japanese and read in Japan. I've, I've done some some research on that. These things did influence, you know, uh, Chinese communism. Mao Zedong was inspired by ancient Sparta. Believe it or not, all this stuff did cross continents as soon as the the link was made through 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 translation. But you know, whether it's Henry the Eighth or Bill Clinton. All these people, you know, went to these texts as a touchstone. And, you know, what they learned from them, good, bad, or otherwise. I mean, different people take totally different le lessons from Plato. And Plato is in some ways a fascist and creates a basis for an outright fascist state. But on the other hand, Plato can be very inspiring for an examination of, of democracy and, and what have you. So, I mean, you know, yeah, my, my final statement on this to, to Melissa was, as meaningful as all this other shit may be, you know, reading about the Korean Ojibwe is meaningful. We're both into it. I mean, if I'd said to Melissa, hey, let's take this and really learn First Nations uh, politics history, she, she would have gone for it, I'm sure. You know, uh, reading about ancient Buddhism and Buddhist philosophy is interesting. I could do that. Or even China. You actually, yeah, Melissa herself, she bought a couple books. You may have seen them in the background. But actually on the history of politics, she's also, we, she was living with me in China and we talked a lot about history of China. It's like, yeah, I mean, you could have taken this time and put it into, you know, communism in China or 19th and 20th century recent history of, of China or something. That's important. 
That's fascinating. But I've got to tell you, this unique legacy and heritage from Greece and Rome, it is actually more important. And that's a conclusion I didn't come to easily or lightly, and I didn't come to it when I was 19 years old and first reading this. So guys, we close this video with the actual reading list for the particular text from ancient Greece, Greece and Rome and the exact order in which we're reading them. Sorry, this is the order I created for Melissa to read. And you can imagine it's going through my head when I'm doing this. Maybe one day I'll do this for my own daughter or my own hypothetical son. At the moment, I only have a daughter. I only have one kid. But, you know, but you know, maybe someone else in the next generation I'll, I'll do this for. I'll sit down and talk this through. So, remarkably, number one on the list is Pseudo-Xenophon. And again, this is because I think the best way, if you're new in this field, to approach this is to understand the political contrast between Sparta and Athens. So starting with an understanding of the, the, the political and legal and cultural context for how, what is the difference between Sparta and Athens? That's being meditated on every point. So pseudo-Xenophon on the constitution of the Spartans. Pardon me, pseudo-Xenophon on the constitution of the Athenians. Then real Xenophon, Xenophon on the constitution of the Spartans, right? So those are two short texts that directly contrast uh, political and cultural conditions in Sparta and, uh, and Athens. Then three texts from Plato. Plato's Euthyphro, Plato's Credo, and Plato's Apology. So a really brief gloss. For me, the Euthyphro really shows you so much about the politics of, of Athens. Again, the fact that these questions can be asked, you know, the, 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 sorry, the, the, the religious and political underpinnings for this conversation, what's unstated, what's implicit, is just as important as what's stated, but what's explicit here, it is showing you the sense in which Socrates is indeed guilty the sense in which Socrates really is a heretic, in which from an Athenian perspective he does deserve to die in his, in his trial, which is coming up in the Credo and the Apology. Now the necessary contrast to Plato's Apology is to get back to Xenophon and read Xenophon's Apology. So sorry, for those of you who don't know, Apology, Apology is a code word here. This is actually about the trial and execution of Socrates. Okay, And then next after that, a big book on the list is uh, Thucydides. Thucydides. The author is the title of the book. So guys, you've seen this particular book on camera before. This is not the complete text of uh, Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War, but this is actually the text I recommend. I do now own a copy of the landmark Thucydides, which is the, the whole unexpurgated text with a bunch of extra maps and added stuff. And at this time, I really do not endorse it. I could do a, a later, a later uh, video uh, talking about that. But this version of Thucydides... It's not that long. It's not going to take you that long to get through. So in case you're intimidated by, by Thucydides, I really recommend that particular uh, edition. Paul Woodruff is the name as the translator, interpreter, uh, etc. Um, in my opinion, it's, it's an excellent um, you know, uh, selection uh, from, from the source text. Okay, and then uh, finally on this short list, Aristotle. Um, the politics, and Aristotle's politics would be excerpts. For me, I think probably even before that, I think number one from Aristotle would actually be the political portions of ethics by, by Aristotle, which is only a couple pages. It's like five pages, but there are five really important pages, five or ten really important pages. Then excerpts from the politics. I don't think anyone needs to read the whole of Aristotle's politics. It's my opinion. Maybe I'll feel differently about it when I come back and make a video, because I know I've, I haven't read this for 20 years or something. Uh, and then Aristotle's Constitution of Athens, a.k.a. the Athenian Constitution, tremendously important. To, so, not that long. It's a pretty, it's a pretty short, it's a pretty short to-do list, people. Um, you know, obviously, you could throw in Herodotus, you could throw in um, a, num a number of other texts, but I think exactly for the political fundamentals I'm talking about here, doesn't involve the mythology, doesn't involve Helena Troy. <laughs> There's a lot of things here you're, you're leaving out you don't need to know. This is getting to the core of what's so meaningful, what's so important about the legacy of Athens and Rome for all of us today.